At this time, Miss Courtney is going to sing for us. What I have to give to you cannot be bought or sold. It can't be wrapped up in a box or tied with strings of gold. It isn't perfect and you'll see it is and even new but Jesus it's the only treasure I can give to you me my gift is me all I am and all I'll ever be I'm not ashamed can be dismissed uh, children's church you can be dismissed children's church this morning uh, amen we'll be over in Ephesians chapter 6 this morning is where we're going to uh, end up if you want to go ahead and turn now you can be turning there Ephesians chapter 6 verse 10 we're going to finish up these messages to, uh, that we've been preaching on spiritual warfare uh, and the battles we're uh, facing. I we'll mentioned this uh, Wednesday night. Don't forget we uh, study the book of Acts on Wednesday night verse by verse here in the sanctuary. We'd love to have you for that study. But at the same time, we have mission kids that's meeting over in this room and then we have uh, uh, the D crews meeting over in the house. So uh, you be sure to be in uh, those services. A lot of things going on here with the kids at Christmas time. So you don't want to miss any of those things. Uh, if you found your place, Ephesians chapter 6 this morning. If you stand with me in verse 10 for reading God's word. This will be the last time we look at it this, uh, this, uh, this uh, morning. So we're going to read the 10 through Verse 18 it says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, power, uh, powers, and against rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand 
Stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking on the shield of faith wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked and take on the helmet of salvation, a sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Verse 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, watching until uh, with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Let us pray. God, we come to you, Lord. I pray, Lord, you help us today as we finish this portion of Scripture, God. I pray that you help us to hide the word in our heart, God, uh, that we may not sin against you, God. We may be better followers of Christ. In your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, we studied the scripture here. We've we've took a look at uh, um, this whole armor of God. David's got her. He's got a Roman soldier up there. Uh, this is a metaphor that the Apostle Paul used uh, to help us understand uh, the provisions God has already made for me and you. Uh, the war's already been won this morning, but me and you are left here on this earth as believers. We've come to know the Lord, and we are going to fight many battles uh, as we wait for the Lord Jesus Christ to come and get us, or that we go by the grave. I want you to know uh, that uh, Satan most certainly, I'll tell you one more time, he's out to destroy your family this morning and destroy your, your marriage. And, and that's, a, that's the first place he'll attack. Those of you that's married, uh, Satan will attack your marriage because if he can get the marriage, he can get mom and daddy, he most certainly is going to get to the kids uh, that way. So he's out to destroy your marriage. You've got to protect your marriage. Uh, you got to protect. And boy, it's hard. It's hard. Even it's hard for two saved people to live together, ain't it, Mama? Amen? Right. And she is, like I said, amen. She has to live with me. Yeah. That ain't easy. I'm not an easy person to live with, Brother Cole. You know, amen. And, and we're different. But just as we learned in Sunday school this morning, my, my, look at Jacob's family. Right. Look at Abraham. Yeah. Look at Isaac. Look at, look, at the, look at the family, the line of Judah that our Savior came from. Right. God chose to use broken people to yeah. spread the gospel yeah. this morning. Amen. Just like me and you. So you may feel like, well, I can't do that. But God called us out. And we are not perfect. We are just born again. We're saved by the grace of God. But notice this. Uh, he said we don't do it in our own strength. Verse 10. We do it in the power of God. God empowers us to serve Him. He empowers us to hand out tracts. He, he empowers us to keep our marriages together. He gives us that strength uh, to do that. He empowers you as a young person to live for the Lord in the school system and to stand up for Christ. You can stand up for Christ. You you don't have to cave into this world. You don't have to live like the rest of the teenagers that live. You can live a, a different life that brings honor to the Lord Jesus Christ this Amen. morning. So I want you to know that, that. He strengthens us in verse 10. He gives us His power. But He said, put on the whole armor of God in verse uh, 11. He said, put on that whole armor that you can stand. And that's what it's about. We've got to be able to stand for the Lord Jesus Christ. But notice what He said in verse 12, that we wrestle not against flesh and blood. You are not my enemy this morning. We are not at war with each other. You and the you young people, you are not at war with each other. The battle's not with brother. My battle's not with brother John. So stop tearing each other down. Start run. Stop running each other in the ground. Quit talking about each other. Say encouraging things to each other. Too often in the house of God, we're tearing people down instead of building them up. We should be able to come to the house of God. We should be encouraging each other. Because my battle is not with you this morning. And it tells us in that verse of Scripture that we wrestle not with flesh and blood. My battle is not with you, but it's with principalities. It's powers of darkness. Ultimately, it's with Satan and his demons that are running about in this world trying to tear down this morning. That is the source of the wickedness this morning. Even as verse 12 says, in high places. So the goal Satan has is to stop you. Even as a believer, he didn't say, Okay, well, you know, you're saved now. I'm not going to bother you no more. That's not what Satan says. 
That, his job is to, he wants you to be rendered spiritually ineffective for Christ. He wants to destroy your testimony at work, at school, and so that you have no power in your life to share the gospel of Jesus Christ this morning. He's out to destroy you and he's out to render you ineffective for God. What he wants to do in basketball terms is he wants to bench you. You understand that, don't you, Isaiah? Right. Getting benched. Right. Yeah, have you ever been benched? Yep. In sports? Yep. That means you're going to go over and sit and watch. That's, right. That's where Satan wants you at spiritually. Yeah. Young people, he wants you over there sitting and watching. Yeah. He doesn't want you out here walking down the parade line, taking a track and saying, here's the gospel. He doesn't want you to tell somebody Jesus loves you. He wants to bench you and put you over there and be rendered ineffective for God. But God said, I'm on your side. He said, I'm going to give you some tools, some spiritual tools that's going to help you to stand. Stand, verse 11, look, stand. He says, withstand. Verse 13, verse 14, what does he tell you to do? Stand, withstand. That's what he gave you this armor for. That you can stand, uh, and you can stand for the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is, ultimately, this is putting on Christ. This is putting on Christ in our lives. This is taking the Word of God and applying it to our lives. And when we do that, we're putting on the armor of God. That's what you're doing. When you take the principles of the Bible and you apply them to your life, you're putting on the armor of God. And so we went over the belt of truthfulness the belt of truth, as we talked about in verse 14. Uh, God's people, don't, they, they, we try to speak truth, right? We don't, tell, we, won't tell, we don't tell lies, right? So we want to put on the belt of truth. We want to speak truth to people. We want to be truthful people, don't we? Right. Yeah? Amen. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. We want to be truthful people. But that belt also represented, I told you, as the men wore the tunics. And as a late, I, I know you guys don't want to hear it, it's sort of like a lady's dress, you know. And you couldn't run or go to battle in that tunic. So what they would do is pull that tunic up and they would tuck it in their belt that they would have on. And, and that would allow them to be ready. What it represented that they was ready to fight. That you're ready to go to war. So when you put on truth, when you put on your belt of truth, you have me you're ready to go on the battlefield you're ready to fight for Christ you're, you're prepared you're equipped you've got everything ready tucked in we ain't satisfied with them little sins we're trying not for perfection but we're striving trying to live for Christ look, for, look like Jesus in our workplace look like Jesus in our, our school so that's what truth is we put on truth we're not going to be happy with the little sins that continue to defeat us we'll have that spirit now this is my spirit and money y'all know this I don't lose Mike I don't like to lose I want to win I'm a winner and I got God's on my side. He's empowering me. I can live for Jesus. If I fall, I get back up and I keep going. I can't stand for somebody let's lay down. We don't quit. And I know it gets hard, church. I know it's tough. But I told my wife this week, what I tell you? I said, I will not quit. I'm not going to quit. I've never been a quitter. You know, I tell my boys, if you sign up for something, you're going to follow through with it. So if you tell me you want to do something, you're going to follow through with it. Okay? You will not be allowed to quit. So that's us. We're ready. Our loins are girded about. That loins girded up. I know that ain't something we use in our English language, but that means you're ready. That's what that means. Verse 14, you've got the breastplate of righteousness on. That's not your righteousness. That breastplate is the imputed righteousness of Christ. That's what it's consisted of. But when you put it on, what you're putting on, you're saying, when I place that breastplate on, that means that I want to live righteous. I want to live holy. I want to strive to do the right thing. So when you place that breastplate on, that's what you're saying to God. God, I, I know I'm not perfect. I know I fail sometimes. I know the flesh is, right. I had to battle against it. Right. But I'm going to strive. I'm going to do my very best to live a righteous life. See, some of us ain't making no effort. Right. We think, well, praise God, I'm saved. I'm on my way to heaven, so I live any way I want to. Right. You ain't got your breastplate on. Right. That's what that means. 
When you put your breastplate on, that means you're striving to do your, to live righteous, Amen. try to live holy. And uh, that's what it means. He said we got our shoes on. Everybody got shoes on this morning. Yeah. Shoes. Don't take them off. Amen. Okay? Some people take them off, we'd be in bad shape this morning, wouldn't we, Cole? Yeah. And I ain't seen Cole. I ain't never hit smelt Cole's feet. I don't know. Around my house, though, I, know, I ain't going to say anybody, but I know we'd be in trouble. Okay? Keep your shoes on. We keep a bottle of funk away in the closet. Any y'all have any of that? No. <laughs> you, you have teenage kids and stuff. We keep a bottle of funk away in there just for those sneakers. Because it's smelling. Well, this ain't this. This is the gospel of peace here. I want you to remember this. It says your feet are shod. That means your feet are fit. Uh, with the gospel of peace. What the gospel of peace is, it means this, that I was an enemy of God because I'm a sinner. I'm lost without God, but when the gospel came in my heart and I know Jesus died on the cross for me, what that brought to my life was peace with God. So now, you are fitted with the gospel of peace. You have those shoes on, meaning that you, God is now, He is on your side. He is not not your enemy anymore. You're not his enemy anymore. He loves you and you love him and you got the gospel of peace and I can stand and say to Satan, God's on my side and you've already lost. That's what the gospel of peace says. So this morning I have the gospel. Hey, Satan, you can do whatever you want to, but I'm not going to hell. You can't send me to hell this morning. Praise God. That ought to be, yes, amen. So we got the gospel of peace on it. We had that shield of faith. David, you still got that picture of them shields up there? Boy, that's a powerful picture. The shield of faith. And what that means is when we believe God, we pick up our shield of faith. When we believe God, when we believe God's word, we are picking up our shield of faith and Satan's shooting fiery darts of doubt. He's shooting uh, fiery darts that says you're not saved. But from the very beginning, what has Satan tried to do? He has tried to da cast doubt over the Word of God, right. over God loving you. Right. From Adam and Eve, he said to Eve in the garden, Hey, hath God really said that? Yeah. And he's been saying it ever since then. What faith says is I believe God. I believe the Word of God. I believe God has told me this is the best way to live my life. And that provides protection for me. I've got my shield up. So when Satan, Satan's shooting those darts, when I pick up and I say, when God says I shouldn't do this, you're picking up your shield. Because God is protecting you. That's what His Word does for us as believers. Then we talked about the helmet of salvation. That helmet's made out of a couple of different... I, I wanted the metal helmet. Because I told you last week about the broad sword that Satan carries. That thing can be up to four foot long. And his goal is to cast, take that thing and bring it down on your head. I want something up here to protect my head. Don't you? Right. Somebody takes a sword and going to cut the top of my head off. I want, a, I want a metal helmet on, don't you? The salvation here, you're already a believer if you're in the battle this morning. But what this represented, when I put on my helmet of salvation, this says this to Satan. I know that my past sins are forgiven. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. The work of salvation is this, Brother Cole. My present sins are being forgiven. Because he said in 1 John 1 and 9, If I confess my sins, he is faithful and just to forgive me of my sins and to cleanse me of all unrighteousness. So when I place the helmet of salvation on my head, I'm saying, Satan, my past sins are forgiven. Hey, salvation is still at work. It's still, he's still making me what I ought to be. I've been justified. I'm being sanctified. And one day I'm going to be glorified. That's what the work of the helmet of salvation says this morning. That my past sins is forgiven. I'm justified. My present sins are being forgiven. I can ask God, say, Oh God, I know I didn't, shouldn't have done that. God, forgive me of my sins. And He's faithful and just to do that. He's making me more like Jesus. Jesus each day, but there's coming a blessed day that glorification is going to take place in this body. And what that means to you, young person, is that I will not have to deal with the flesh anymore.
anymore. I'll have a glorified body. There'll be no presence of sin anymore because I'm going to be in the presence of God and I'm going to have a glorified body, a glorified mind, and I'll be living with Jesus. We won't be worrying about, hey, Brother David, no more sickness will be there. We won't worry about no COVID, Brother, brother uh, Luke, this morning because we'll have a glorified body this morning. Praise God, I won't lose nobody else. I'm tired of losing people this morning. People that I love. People that I care about. There won't be no more death around there. I won't have to bury no more brothers. Praise God. Because I'm glorified and I got on the helm of salvation. I'm saying to Satan this morning, Hey, my sins are forgiven. I'm a child of God. That's good enough right there. <laughs> we can stop right there and go home. But we're not. <laughs> I know y'all want more. I know you do. Uh, this last one, and we'll talk about this for a few minutes. You look in verse 16. Here, all you young boys, y'all like swords. I know you do. I used to carry pocket knives. Man, I remember when I got one of them like them uh, Rambo boy knives. I'd go out and chop all the limbs I could around. You know what I'm saying? I just love cut stuff. You know, that's, it's, I don't know. It's a boy thing. Some of your girls might have been that way. I don't know. I like that. Tuck two edges on it. You know, yeah. cut something. Yeah. We're going to talk about something. That's what this last one is. It says, take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. In my mind, uh, without the Word of God, we couldn't really know much about the other pieces of the armor. It's very fitting to finish with this one. I don't know that there's a necessary a, a order of a structure or a priority here, but I do know this, without the Word of God, we wouldn't know about any, anything else. We wouldn't know about salvation. We wouldn't know about faith. Without the Word of God, we wouldn't know about truth. So when we know about the Word of God, when we take up this sword of the Spirit, and in this sword here, this is a very, I told you about two swords that a Roman soldier often carried. Uh, this would be the broad sword. It's pretty large, but uh, oftentimes he would carry a so, uh, one is much like a dagger. Uh, he would carry it. It was very precision, a very precision instrument. Might not think about Peter cutting the ear of the guy off in the garden. It'd take a very precision cut. So when we think about this sword of the Spirit, we're going to think about this in this very precise, very makes very precise cuts. Look at that, David. I knocked it off. Here, Mom. I got a 60 degree arm here and I can't pin nothing on there. So give me just a time out here for just a second, Miss Sand. Thank you, Mom. So <laughs> when we think about that this morning, we're thinking about that sword. We're thinking about that particular sword. And uh, this is this sword is the Word of God this Amen. morning. Amen. I don't know what your thoughts are concerning the Bible, the Word of God, but let me tell you this. I know you think you may think that men wrote this book this morning, but I want to tell you first of all that the author of this book is God. Amen. Let me give you something here. Turn if you turn over Second Timothy, I'll read it to you. You don't have to turn if you want to. Second Timothy three sixteen tells us this: All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Right. That means the the Word of God is actually God breathed. He actually he God through the Holy Spirit uh, uh, inspired men. Our inspired men that in, in that was lived during these time periods. He he gave them the very words to speak. The Holy Spirit is what guides us today, right? We have the Holy Spirit in us. The Holy Spirit teaches us all things. It did for those men also. It inspired them to pen the words that's in this amazing book we call the Bible this morning. And then after that, God chose you and me to be instruments to take this book and to proclaim it to a, a lost and dying world. He chose broken people like me and you, just like the broken men. Those men that penned this wasn't perfect men by no means, but the Holy Spirit inspired them to pen the Word of God. The Holy Spirit can inspire me and you today to be instruments in the hands of God to proclaim claim the Word of God by the author of God to a lost and dying world this morning. That's God's plan. And I said, well, man, that, that sounds like a pretty simple plan. Well, it is. We make this really complicated. But the plan of salvation is this, that He wants to use you to tell somebody.
somebody about Jesus. Amen. And so we talk about this book, him being the author of this book. We can't get distracted from what our primary mission here is. I know we build floats. I know that. But our primary mission is the gospel of Jesus Christ going forward today. Amen. That's it, church. Young people, that's why you're here this morning. That's why you're going to get on the float. That's why you're going to hand out a track. It's so somebody, Miss Judy, can hear about the, the author of this book, God, who was incarnated in the flesh, in a manger, born on Christmas Day, to live and to die so that me and you might have salvation this morning. Right. Amen. In a nutshell, that's it. Brother Cole's preaching on the prophesied Messiah. He's all through this book, ain't he, Brother Cole? I asked Brother Cole to preach primarily in the Old Testament because we don't think Jesus is in the Old Testament, but guess what? He's there. Amen. He's all through the book. So this book is, 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 is God is the author of it. It's inspired by God. Uh, the, the inspiration of the Bible. I want to talk to you about that in just a minute. Do you realize what kind of book you hold in your hands? I tell you what, it's, it's truly, this is the most, I don't want to def say literature, but it, it is the most complex piece of literature in the history of the world. All of you young people have books at school. There's never been a book penned at no time in history of the world like this Bible. There's no other book in this world that's infallible like our Bible. Now, I'm going to tell you a few things about that. And first, that it is infallible. Psalms 87, or Psalms 19.7 says, The law of the Lord is perfect. That means this Bible has no error in it. There is absolute truth. That means it's flawless. That means there's, it makes, there's no mistakes in it. That means it's without blemish. There's, there's nothing wrong in this Bible. It is absolute truth this morning. So when I refer to the inspiration of the Bible, I say, it's in, I say the Bible's infallible. That means it absolutely cannot be wrong. This is the history of the world. Now I know you. I know I'm looking at y'all, uh, several young people this morning, and I know that you have history classes, and I know that they tell you that there was a big bang, and this world just come about. I, I realize that, but let me tell you this: it's a lie. Amen. Yep. Yep. I say that wholeheartedly in my heart, knowing the truth. Amen. The Bible is your history book. Amen. And it's flawless. It's without error this morning. And so I stand here this morning before you saying it is absolutely the history of where you come from, what you need to do with your life, and where you're going. Right. That's the Bible this morning. It's infallible. It's inerrant. And that, what, what does that inerrant word mean? It, it's incapable of being wrong. The Bible can't be wrong. My wife says that about me. <laughs> Kimberly, roll her eyes over. I've seen that, Kimberly. So you think you can't be wrong. Brother Mike, I think that a lot of times. But guess what? I'm wrong. <laughs> and then I have to come back and say, Miss Tiffany, I'm sorry I was wrong. <laughs> but let me tell you, there's a lot of people can be wrong. There's a lot of people in this world that's wrong. There's a lot of uh, people that wrote the books that you look at in school that's wrong. But let me tell you this, when I say the Bible is inerrant, it is absolutely incapable of being wrong this morning. Amen. This is our sword, guys. <laughs> hey, you think about that? Proverbs 35 says this, every word of God is pure. That pure means that it, is, it, it proves to be true. And, and He is a shield unto them that put their trust in Him. There's no error found in any part of the Bible. And, and, and for us, we stick to the King James translation because we believe it, it is rich and full and, and it's accurate. And the words that's translated, Brother Cole studies it, Brother, any of y'all studies the word of God, you'll see as you look at the Greek and Hebrew, you just have, you grasp so much more of the meaning of the verse when we look at it. 
uh, through the eyes of that King James Version, but this is also said, Proverbs 30 and 6, Add thou not unto his word, lest he reprove thee, and they, thou be found a liar. One thing the, God, the Bible does, the Bible, I told you, was incapable of being wrong, but what the Bible does do, the Bible reveals a liar. Yeah, sure. <laughs> the Bible reveals a liar. It reveals a lie. That's what the Bible does. So listen, guys, if we're going to live or place our lives and trust our lives with something, wouldn't you want to trust your life with something that's incapable of being wrong? Amen. Wouldn't you want to trust the Word of God is infallible and in, 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 in total? It's inerrant in every part of it. It's incapable of being wrong. That's something you want to live by. Right. It's complete. Turn to Revelation 22. And we find a, a word, a testimony from John concerning the Word of God. Revelation 22 and 18. He says this, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in the book. If any man shall take away from the words of the book, that's the Bible, of these prophecies, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. So the Bible is complete. It doesn't need me to write another chapter and add it to revelations. It doesn't need me to add anything to the Word of God this morning. And for us that teach and study the Scriptures, it also stresses the importance of us too this morning to spend the time laboring in the Word of God, studying and preparing so that when we stand to teach the Word of God, I don't want to add something that's not there. Because God holds that, that's very serious, and He's going to hold me accountable for what I'm telling you this morning. Do you realize that I'll stand before God and I'll answer for the message I preached to you this morning? Yeah. God is very serious about His Word, and He doesn't need me to add anything away from it, or uh, add anything to it, or take anything away from it. Right. That's why it's so hard sometimes, guys, when it comes to preaching on sin. You know, I, see, I look out there and you see people and say, well, all y'all's good people. All y'all's good people. Boy, then you have to preach on sin. You have to tell somebody it's not okay if you live together outside of marriage. Yeah. And people get upset about that. Right. But listen, I can't ignore what's in the book. I can't ignore that homosexuality is wrong. I can't ignore that. I have to preach the truth because I'm accountable for the truth. It's complete. It don't need me to add anything to it or take anything away from it, Miss right. Judy. Right. God's Word is complete this morning. Amen. It's authoritative. Psalms, uh, Isaiah 1-2 says this, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth. When God speaks, everybody needs to listen. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he is the ultimate authority. I'm not the authority this morning. Listen. Isaiah answers to me as his father. And, and I love my son. Just like Jonah, he answers to me as his father. But ultimately, Isaiah answers to God. God's the ultimate authority. You have to obey your parents, but ultimately, who, you're, who are you obeying when you obey your parents? You're obeying God. Because the one thing God said for you to do in, a, in Ephesians chapter 6, and verse 1 two, through 3, was this. Your primary job, and I remind him of this, is to obey your parents. He didn't give you all a whole lot to do. Just obey. Whoo, preacher, what are you talking about this morning? Obey my parents? Well, that's it. But ultimately, you are obeying your parents, but what are you doing ultimately? You're pleasing God when you do. God's looking at you, and He's saying, you're obeying your parents. That's what I commanded you should do. You're following the principles and teachings of Scripture, and God is pleased with your life. Right. Amen. That's Scriptures. Amen. So we talk about that. It, it, it's the ultimate authority. It's sufficient. 2 Timothy tells us that the Holy Scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation. At the end of this life, and I know some of you are young, Fisher's young, Shelby's young. You're not thinking about the end of life, okay? I don't, you think about, probably think about what you're going to eat for lunch. 
Right, Fisher? <laughs> he says, yep, you got my number right there. But you think about the scriptures and we think about the word of God and what it actually reveals to us. It reveals to us salvation. And that's what it says. It makes us wise into salvation. The only thing that's going to matter at the end of life when it comes down to it is not how big your house is. It's not that you pay, played for the Warriors and your name's Stephen Curry and you the all time going to be the all-time greatest scorer of the NBA. That's not going to merit matter. When God, when he stands before God, he's going to say, how many three-point shots did you shoot? Right. <laughs> you think is God going to say that how many home runs did you hit yeah. or he, uh, Cole how many, how many of them ducks or geese which is it did you kill how many, how many yeah, I you, you know what I'm saying I, I mean I'm talking to the guys but it, in the grand scheme of things what the word of God the primary thing it, it reveals to us is that it's sufficient to give us salvation. It reveals to us the babe in the manger. It shows us a Savior that died on the cross. And it shows us this, that God loves you this morning. You may be in this service this morning, and, and you really, you may not feel very loved at home. You may not feel very loved at school. But what the Scriptures reveal to us through salvation, salvation's a picture of love. That somebody loves you enough to want to rescue from a place that called hell. Isn't that a beautiful picture this morning? So you may be in the service this morning. I say the Bible's sufficient. I say the Bible's sufficient. When I, when I say it's sufficient, it's sufficient unto salvation. And that reveals to us a lot of things. As we look on, it's effective. Isaiah 55, 11, So shall my words be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return void, but it shall accomplish that which I please. Guys, if I didn't believe, if I didn't believe this scripture, this Bible was true, I, I wouldn't be up here preaching it to you this morning. I wouldn't waste your time or my time this morning. If I didn't believe this, Cole, if I didn't believe this is 100% truth, God was the author of it, I wouldn't be up here preaching this. Listen, guys, I, I, could be out, I could be out making money. Yeah. I could, you could be out doing a lot of things today. You know? I come here because I believe this is absolute truth. Amen. I believe everything that's in it. I believe what I'm saying to you this morning is the truth. And one thing about it, what a person does with the Bible reveals his relationship to God. It's a little tough right here. Just give me a few minutes and we're about done. What a person does with the Bible reveals his relationship to God. I'll be honest with you, I, I was saved several years and I didn't spend much time in the Bible. Really. I didn't allow it to change me. Sometimes I understand where you are babes in Christ, but listen to this scripture. John eight forty seven. He that is of God heareth the words of God's words. He that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not because ye are not of God. The one that hears the words of God is of God. The one that ignores the words of God basically is not of God. If you follow the teachings of the Bible, that shows you belong to God, doesn't it? If you do not follow the teachings of the Bible, that says you're not mine. Well, I know that's hard. That's where I talk to you about, well, God, that's where we get to the tough part of it, ain't it? For me, too. The Bible is the determiner of man's eternal destiny and his relationship with God. I'll give it to, to you another way. James one twenty two. Be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. When we talk about picking up the sword of the Spirit here, now remember we're talking about the whole armor of God. This sword is what we live our lives by. Why do I spend time reading it to my family? Because I believe it won't return void. I'm just reading it. Me and Isaiah and Jonah... I've been reading a chapter every morning. Why do I do that? 
because I believe just simply the reading of the Word of God is going to change this young man's life and mine too. I believe the principles of the Bible, we want to pick up our sword and apply those principles to our lives. I, I, want, to, I want them to hear that. I want them to take and use that. Why? Because I know Satan's going to come and try to destroy this young man's life and my life and my wife's life and try to destroy our family and our marriage. And God's saying, pick up the sword this morning. Pick up the sword. I, I give you everything you need right here in scriptures. Don't just be hearers of the word, but take what the word gives you and apply it to your lives. Don't quit. Don't quit. I know it's hard. I know you're battling with the flesh. I know that YouTube says to do this. I know that your friends are telling you to do this. But God's telling you the truth this morning. Pick up your sword and you fight. You fight with God. You stand on God's side. Because I already know how this is going to end. God has already won the war. I'm on God's side. I'm going to take my sword and I'm going to fight. You are, that's what I want you to do this morning. Put on the whole armor of God. Pick up the sword of the Spirit. Take the principles out of the Word of God. Apply it to your life. Hebrews 4.12 says, So in the Word of God is quick. It's powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even, dividing us under the soul and the spirit and the joints and the marrow, and is a discerner whew, of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. That's right. Mm. That's right. That's precision. That Roman soldier's dagger. Right. I don't know what your intent is this morning. But see, God does. Yeah. Sure. Sure. He knows the very intent of your heart this morning. He knows what you're thinking about right now. I want to encourage you, church. Stand with me, Miss Courtney, if you come.